Hey guys, this is Emery. Welcome to the Kirby Connects podcast. And with me today, I have the amazing Ben Miller. Ben, What's up, everybody? You, I'm doing great. I'm excited yeah, to get to talk man. about this today. Yeah, isn't it awesome? We, uh, we, you guys, us, have gone through all four Gospels and we are down to the last three chapters. I'm so proud Come of you on. guys for hanging in there. Way to go. Yeah, hanging in with the podcast, hanging in. With the reading, uh, you know, every time, every time, Ben, that I read through this, uh, there's something I see. Yeah, I mean, never seen. I mean, even today, we get to see kind of the the cool things that you notice when you compare the accounts right next to each other. Yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, we'll get into some of that a little bit later, but you do realize that it's, you're not getting parts of the story you're getting four mm -hmm. stories that show like four different aspects of yeah this like you just said the greatest thing to happen in human history yeah and the way that we get to study that in the gospels is has been really cool you know it, that's such an important thing and, and like to to overuse an overused analogy uh-huh uh, -huh. <laughs> uh it, if today you know god forbid you saw a car accident and you were at a at the scene of a car accident. Mm. You were standing on yep. one side of the car, and the police ask you what you saw. You would you would give your report of what you saw. If there was someone on the other side of the street, and they asked them, they would give the report of what they saw. If someone a football field away in front, and yep. they asked them, they would have some things in common. They would have some things different, but they would all be true. True. And together, they would fill in that picture. And that's why, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, that's totally the case. Yeah, You, you for get sure. a, a fuller picture by seeing the perspective uh, filtered through the personalities of three different guys to three different audiences who focus in three different ways on the same event, Yeah, not conflicting each other, not invalidating each other. Yep but giving a fuller version of the truth uh, of the most miraculous, most significant time in human history. Exactly. And so in these last three chapters of John, we get to see what most of the Bible is culminating to in this yeah. final Passion Week of Jesus, like we just celebrated at Easter almost a month ago, a month ago now. But yeah. John paints the picture a little bit different than than maybe some of the other gospel writers do. Yeah, he sure does. It, and, you know, I don't know that we get to... Do you get to have a favorite gospel? Yes. Do oh, you? absolutely yeah, you do. I, I, I yes. think it's okay. Uh -huh. Because just like they're, they're written by guys that are wired different ways, uh -huh. like we're wired in different yeah. ways. Yes, and that's kind yeah. of yeah, part so, of the beauty of it. So I'm just going to tell you, John is my favorite. Owned it right here. I owned it. it Everybody is. can come after you now. <laughs> They're all awesome. And if you are a Matthew, Mark, Luke favorite person, it's on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll compare Gospels later. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, uh, man, man, oh man. I don't even, I don't even have words for, for how amazing this. But today I want to focus, I want to focus on one aspect of what is going on here. So we are... In chapter 19, we're so near the cross in, in the beginning here, but we're with Pilate, we're with the Jews. When it says the Jews, it doesn't mean all of the Jews. It doesn't every, mean the entire Jewish every nation. Every random right there. Jewish person yeah. in the nation of Israel at that time, it means the, the Jewish leaders the, from the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin to the uh, Herodians. It means the leaders here, but we're talking Pilate, we're talking Jewish leaders, and there is this crazy jockeying for everybody in the situation thinks that they are in control. Yeah. That what is happening before their eyes is a product of their intention, is a product of their plan, mm -hmm. and that ultimately everybody is in charge of Jesus standing where he is right, right now. So Pilate, Pilate, he, he says he finds no basis for a charge at all. Like, right. which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Like the Romans, like True. 
they don't really have to research a bunch. No, like they had complete and total authority to yeah. do whatever they wanted with him. Absolutely, which is evidenced by the fact that uh, the Jews even came to Pilate and the Romans. The only reason they came to Pilate was because the Roman Empire had taken away their right to capital punishment. They were not allowed to kill anybody, so they yeah. wanted Jesus dead. So they had to come to the Romans and try to present this case that Jesus was worthy of a capital offense and True. should be killed. They thought they were killing Jesus. Like, that, mm -hmm. like hey, Jesus may have his own plan, yeah. but we're in charge here. So the Jews insist. They say, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be, claimed to be God. Basically, they're saying, hey, we're in charge here. We have a Jewish law, not a Roman law. Right. And we, as the Jews, in charge of religious matters, even in a Roman colony, we're in charge right now, and you have to do what we have to say. Uh -huh. Right. So later on, in, in 1910, uh, Pilate's mad because Jesus won't answer him. You know, Pilate's mm. not used to not being answered. Uh -huh. A Roman governor is not used to not being answered. A procurator is not used to being answered. And he says, do you refuse to speak to me? He said, don't you realize I have the power uh, to either free you or to crucify you? So now Pilate thinks he's in charge. And as a representative of the Roman government, he thinks the Roman government is in charge. And Jesus you know, just answers in only a way that Jesus can. Ooh, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one that handed me over to you is guilty of an even greater sin. So, Pilate is there, really. He's a chess piece. Yeah. He, he, it does seem that way, that like he was set up for this moment by God yeah. to get to the place where Jesus needed to be. Yeah, absolutely. So he, he's been there. The, the plan that it would be Pilate has probably been in place for since time a long, memorial, a long before time, time yep. since the beginning of time, before yep. the foundation of the world. Uh, but Pilate's convinced that like he has the ability to be magnanimous and stop this event yeah. from happening. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, hey, I have the ability to set you free. No, you really don't. And really does everything that his power can allow him to do he does. to bring about that end that he wants. He does. And it actually says, like, he becomes more afraid uh -huh. as the Jews keep pushing in on him. But so it, it goes on in verse 12 that uh, Pilate tries to set him free, but the Jews keep shouting, uh, you know, if you let this guy go, you're no friend of Caesar. You have to understand, like, okay, now you're talking to what's going to affect Pilate. Right. Like, you do not want to be seen as no friend of Caesar. True. He's going to lose his job. He's going to lose his life. And, and they say that anyone who claims to be king opposes Caesar. Yeah. Uh, so Pilate answers and he says, you know, sh shall I crucify your king? And the Jewish leaders say, we have no king but Caesar. <laughs> okay, so come on. They are playing. They're full of it. They are. They're, they're so playing full of it. my lands. And this is not the only time that they're playing. They know full well what they're doing. Yep. And they think they're in charge because they don't recognize Caesar as the king of anything. Yeah. They can't stand Caesar. Never would have. And then they any say... Circumstance. We have, you know, we only have one king. It reminds me in the old Old Testament uh, when when they say a similar. When have we ever been slaves? Mm, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> true. Like, what exactly. Are you talking about? Yep. Your whole history is built on yeah. the fact that you were slaves for four hundred years. But hey, so what? What does all of that matter? What is? What does any of this matter? Right. At the end of the day, who's in charge? God was in charge. Jesus was the, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. This was God's plan. It wasn't Rome's plan. Yeah. It wasn't the Jewish leader's plans. This was God's plan. And this was God's plan for you and for me mm -hmm. to set us free. And I, I think, so the question for us maybe is, who's in charge of your life? Yeah. 
You know, it, it's easy for us as, as Christians today, and we wouldn't really say it this way, but it's easy for us to say, you know, hey, I'm in charge and I'm deciding what role Jesus will play in my life. Is, mm-hmm. is Jesus, uh, Jesus coming into my life as an add-on that, that I get to keep my plans, my goals, and everything, and I just bring him in when I need him to rescue me or to, uh, to take care of a situation or to help me to uh, further my goals. And, and it just reminded me of this debate. Uh, it's not a debate, but the difference between everybody wants Jesus as a Savior. Yeah. Everybody wants to be rescued. Everybody wants to be set free from hell. It's a great thought to think that, like, my eternity is secured and and I'm not going to hell. Everybody wants that thought. But then to move on to that that thought of, do you you want Jesus as Lord? The one one with authority. Yeah, the one Mm -hmm. with authority over you. The one that, that you make your decisions based on what he wants. That he is ultimately in charge of the outcome of every moment. Yeah. That you live in uh so for us god is in charge jesus willingly went to the cross to solve the problem of our sin it's kind of a kind of a deep scary thought but if you think about the outcome of it uh it's a wonderful thought uh like the song how deep the father's love is for us it was my sin that held him there yeah the reason why Jesus is in the situation that we're reading about today Mm that changed the course of history. It's because we are sinful, fallen people, and God himself came to set us free so that he can be our Savior, but also be our Lord, and we can live in freedom. Which then leads him to that greatest of miracles is that after, after his death, Three days later, we get to see the interaction between with Mary at the empty tomb, yeah, running to go and get and get Peter and John. And I told Emery before, like I love the fact that John adds in that he was faster, that yeah. he ran yeah. faster to Little the tomb. Little comic relief, right? For real, <laughs> like in the middle of this super heavy moment, man. John and Peter took off, but John got there yeah. first. And so they they get there. John won't go in though. Peter finally oh. goes in to actually to actually investigate. Yeah. And then we get this beautiful moment between the resurrected Jesus and Mary, where in a moment where she's distraught, she's looking for wherever they've taken this the body of Jesus. She hasn't realized what's happened yet. Jesus is almost playing like playing dumb with her, to, like asking her these questions, making yeah. out like he's the the gardener. And then eventually it just says that Jesus said to her, Mary, like nothing else yeah. except yeah. her name. And in that moment, she turns and she realizes who it is and what's happened and she breaks mm-hmm. down. And it just reminds me of the, of the verses when he says, like, I call my sheep by their name yeah. and they hear my voice and they know who I am. Yeah, I love and it's it. This, it's this beautiful, this beautiful time of redemption to me and ultimately showing a lot of the the plan of Jesus. He appears to his disciples two more times. And then I want to focus on this third time, because I think it is one of the most beautiful bookends to, Mm -hmm. to our study of the gospel as it references even back to events in, in other gospels too. All of chapter 21, I think is about one person and the redemption of that one person. And it's Peter. Yeah. If you remember where Peter is before this moment, there's the denial of him, of Jesus three times that we read about in the um, in our reading from last week. Mm-hmm. But now he gets to this place where he says, "I'm going out to fish," and I think it's a great point to realize that when when our faith gets wrecked a lot, when our life gets wrecked, you go back to what you know. Yeah. And Peter was was a fisherman. He understood fish. He could rely on where the fish would be. He mm-hmm. knew these things about, about their patterns and about being on a boat. And he could trust in that. And so in the moment when he gets shook, he goes out to fish. But once again, can't catch anything. Yeah. And it yeah. sets up. Similar to something else, right? Sets up similar to something else that you read probably about a month ago in Luke 5. 
When a man calls from the shore or Jesus is there close to the boat and says, toss it on to the other side. Yeah. And in the first moment, they don't realize who Jesus is from the shore. Yeah. And I think like as soon as these nets fill up, John and Peter realize and they're like, oh my word, it's Jesus. Yeah. And Peter, man, like you have to love him, dude. Like he strips down to like next to nothing based yeah. on what the text says yeah. and jumps in after the oh, yeah. water to swim for he's Jesus. Out. He's gone. He's, he's not thinking he's in, a, he's in a boat, man. Yeah. There's everybody else is there, but Peter's bailing. Like he's he's yeah. gone. He's swimming back to Jesus. Now listen, the cool thing about what we've said about studying all these books together is you can compare. Why does Jesus do the same miracle a second time? Yeah. And I think yeah. in this moment, Jesus is getting Peter to this point where he's remembering back all the way to the beginning. Yeah. Like three years before that, where after this same miracle happens, he falls at Jesus' feet and says, like, you are clearly a holy man and I am not. Then Jesus still calls him into following him and says, I'm going to have you fish for people now. Yeah. He's getting him to this point where he's getting him ready to acknowledge something about himself that he's not ready to yet. So they get to the shore. There's this super interesting detail to me where Jesus is sitting there and the text specifically says that it's a fire of burning coals that Jesus is cooking on. Now, the only other time, there's plenty of Greek words for fire, but mm -hmm. there's a very specific one that is like known as like a charcoal fire. The only yeah. other time it's used in the book of John is a few chapters earlier in John 18, when Peter is standing by a charcoal fire to get himself warm, yeah. which is the same setting where he denies Jesus three times. Yeah. Jesus is setting up this whole setting, this whole scenario to bring Peter back to this point that then culminates in this moment of him asking him the same question three times yeah. when Jesus says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, a lot there's been a lot of like debate on what the these is that Jesus is talking about. Yeah. Um, essentially, the two options are like they bring up the fish. And so Jesus is like looking at the fish saying, G like, Peter, do you love me more than fishing? Which mm -hmm. lifestyle are you going to choose? And I see that. That makes perfect sense to me. Or the these that could also be there is just the other disciples that are yeah. all that are mm -hmm. all sitting there, too. Both make perfect sense. I don't see a reason to pick one. Yeah. Um, because yeah. I think Jesus's point remains pretty much the same. He mm -hmm. asked me, do you love me more than G these? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus responds, feed my lambs. Again, he asked him the same question and the same response happens. And the third time he asked him the same question and the same response. Now, listen, people have said before that this is just, that this is some sort of randomness, that this is added in here. And you just can't believe that way about Jesus, that in these last moments, he's going to be random. Instead, yeah. what I want to show you is this, is that Jesus asked him the same question three times because Peter denied him three times. Jesus has him reaffirm in this moment, not as an act of, not as an act of penance, but maybe I think even just to tell Peter, I know what happened while, while I was up on the cross dying. I know that you were around denying me to other people. Like, I know what you did. I saw all of that. And my charge to you is, is still the exact same as it yeah. was before. It's still yeah. go out and fish for people. It's still to feed my lambs. It's still mm -hmm. to love me more than all of these other things around you. Which then leads him into like Jesus and Peter's his last interaction where Jesus essentially predicts that Peter is going to die in a mm -hmm. terrible way. Yeah. And man, and at the end of it, he just says, follow me. Which oh, is yeah. like, to the some sense, there's a cliffhanger to this because... You know, Peter, we don't yep. get to see the end of the Peter story from John's gospel. But what we do get to see is, I mean, man, now we look back at Peter as being this rock that the church was built on and this foundation of, of a lot of our faith and the religion that we have passed down to us now and the way that we see Jesus all the way thousands of years later. And I can't think that any of it would happen if Jesus doesn't redeem this moment for Peter right here, yeah. mm -hmm. where Jesus takes his guilt and his shame and his falling away and this terrible thing that he did and says, yeah. I know about that, but recommit to following me and my mission for you is still the very much exact same.
Absolutely. In your life, man, I think Jesus is constantly looking for those areas where guilt and shame make you want to give up that promise that God has given you. Even some of the things that you've done before make you want to give up on that seeking after Jesus, that following after God and that promise that he wants for you. And that's not Jesus's intention. His intention is for you to see what you did, reaffirm your love for him, and continue on with the mission that he has given you. Yeah, I lo- hey, I love that you, when you book into those those two miracles, it, it just reminded me of what, when you, you start following Jesus and you go on and you follow Jesus and, and along along the way, sometimes maybe you have an epic fail. Yeah. And, yeah. and the God of restoration mm-hmm. uh, walks into that with, with the idea of, hey, let's go back to the beginning. Ooh, yeah. Let's go back, like even in Revelation, yeah. hey, you know, go back to your first love. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you got way off track here, but go back to your first love. And that's what that just reminds me of. And I, and I agree with you. The whole exchange of do you love me was a necessary exchange for Peter. Yeah. It, it was a very intentional moment of restoration that yep. is beautiful and needed for him. So yeah, you crushed that. To get, to get to that point. And so then finally, John gives us one detail as you're reading. If you think it's odd that there's somebody there who keeps referring to themselves as the disciple that Jesus loved. That is John for some reason, not referencing himself in this book. Um, There's a thousand reasons that people posit for this. It could just be he didn't want to add in his own name. It could be him trying to not be prideful. It could be that for religious persecution and other things and other things like that. It's a theory. It's just important to know that when there's, when there's somebody referenced that is the disciple that Jesus loved, John is very humbly referring to himself. And then he ends it with this, with this beautiful thing that Jesus did so many other things, and if every one of them was written down, there would not be enough books in the entire world for it all to be written. Yeah. Which is this beautiful end to this gospel story that we see about Jesus, that even though we have these written accounts, even that is not enough to contain all of who he was, all of what he did for us, yeah. and all that he can be for us forever. And so thank you for reading through the Gospels with us. We hope you have a great day and we'll see you in church on Sunday.